because now I have the pleasure to introduce Sophie Proust, CTO of Autos and board member of the International Data Spaces Association, and a fireside chat with here on stage, uh, Petra Heinrich, uh, VP of Partners and Product at Red Hat. Um, and they're going to discuss how to scale open source in Europe. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you, Astor, for introducing us. I now have pictures of, uh, what was it, a flywheel in my brain, various different pictures. So let's, let's see if we can paint this a little bit together, Sophie, as we go along. Absolutely. So the, <laughs> the launch today, so first of all, good afternoon, everyone. I assume you have been busy listening in um, for the entire afternoon. So I hope that you will still stay with us for another, I'd say probably 30 minutes, Sophie. Yes. Um, especially as we had uh, such an important launch today of the EU's open source report, which is both warmly welcome and also a timely reminder as to the importance of open source across Europe. And indeed, the report's findings and recommendations speak volumes to our own compass and also my personal compass over the past, whatever, yeah, 20 to 30 years. So open unlocks the world's potential. And therefore, I'm delighted to be joined by Sophie Proust, CTO of Atos, to discuss over the next 30 minutes on the fireside chat about um, more aspects around open hybrid cloud, but also about open source and how, this, how we drive this jointly into the enterprises. So, but before doing so, um, can I first ask you, Sophie, to reflect on today's um, EU study results and significant contribution to European economy, e.g. 10% of, of open source contribution equals 0.4% GDP increase. In short, how have you seen a lift this through your career, but also um, through your position at Atos? Absolutely. Thank you, Petra. And also, first of all, for me, I'd like to say that I'm very happy uh, to be with you and to share this fire chat um, and attend this uh, great uh, EU Open Source Policy Summit uh, 2021. And I think it was a great honor and chance, you know, to have this introduction from uh, Thierry Breton, uh, whose thought leadership and vision is always uh, inspiring. And uh, I, I want also to raise, before answering to your question, Petra, the fact that this conference is really amazingly in sync, you know, with our own thinking at Atom, mm -hmm. the role of open in the green transition, the digital sovereignty, and also the EU competitiveness, and uh, also the idea of challenging ourselves to answer to the question of how do we create a winning open source culture uh, in Europe uh, <laughs> is really a very good one. And um, so, you know, also I want to raise the fact that uh, our partnerships, and I'm very happy to do this uh, uh, talk with you on open source because our partnerships are really along this line. Huh? If we look at it, we have been working together yeah. for more than 12 years. Uh, yeah. We started yeah. with HPC, huh? High Performance <laughs> Computing. And yes. actually why I raise this, because it uh, really relies on open source. Uh, for the operating system, you talk about Linux, uh, communication layer, MPI, the compilers, GNU, the resource and job scheduling, uh, Slurm, the file system, Luster, and you know, we could go on and on on this list. Uh, and what's very interesting is that the communities have always been building those software, reflecting on the best way to address scalability, resilience, and now we see that we are adding new words green sovereignty and competitiveness. And uh, so for that, I, I, I mentioned the fact that uh, we are, and, uh, and of course myself too, uh, as a, a former Bull, Bull uh, uh, employee, uh, Bull has been acquired by uh, Atos in 2014, we have designed and brought to production the first petascale uh, system in Europe uh, for CEA. So you see, actually, uh, open source is really part of my culture, part of Atos culture too. And I think it has been said uh, during the previous talk, but uh, really fundamental for R&D development. So I gave the example of HPC, but as you said, actually, it really open source spreads across all the digital space huh, where uh, Atos has uh, technology leadership. I'm talking about cybersecurity, cloud applications, uh, all this. <laughs> So when you say our relationship really goes back a long, long, long time, yeah. Sophie, cloud was not even around at that You're time. You're right. So yes. We started really from scratch. We learned the hard way together what open source means, what open source in enterprise means, and how we keep going. But now looking at cloud, which is a massive driver for our joint relationship, and now think 
our technical teams and our business teams have really put their brains together over the past. Um, it is a core to successfully help our joint customers to be successful with their transformational project, being faster in digitalization and really speeding this up. Can you tell us a bit more about the Atos offerings and why you choose an open source technology? Yes, you're right. Huh? Uh, well, you know, we, we launched uh, at the end of last year a very good, great program called uh, Atos One Cloud. It's uh, an initiative where we want to proactively accelerate uh, our clients' migration to the cloud. And uh, it, as you said, largely rely on open source based technology. Uh, and uh, let me give you uh, an example of uh, when we talk about migration to the cloud. Well, there's some steps, you know, to, uh, to pass. And uh, I want to take the example of a, a, a typical uh, customer migrating to the cloud, which has uh, an enterprise database. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we've worked on those examples because we know it's not easy. And uh, based on our uh, Bull Sequana hardware, we have created an offering called Bare Metal as a Service, which really enables uh, our customers to run their database services in a private data center yet seamlessly seen as part of the cloud uh, virtual environment. Mm -hmm. So why do I mention this? Well, because that service implementation largely relies on open source technologies. Uh, for example, state management with MongoDB, but also for orchestrating and managing the hardware assets, you know, with dynamic allocation and configuration, uh, relies on uh, Apache Airflow, but also uh, Red Hat Ansible. Mm -hmm. And also for ITSM and CM integration, we are complying to a Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So you see, not only does open source accelerate our customers' migration to the cloud, but it has been an example on how our engineering teams could focus also on the business value. And for me, this is very important because mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the, the, the value creation uh, is, um, is possible because we rely on established open source standards uh, mm -hmm. for the underlying element. And, uh, also, if we push a little bit for, forward or if we think of what's happening, you know, those days with the, the, the COVID situation and the increased demand on sovereignty, we see really the, the, the progress to more industry specific cloud to mm -hmm. specialized data spaces for health, manufacturing, finance. And this will fuel the demand for more open source based solutions. So you see, we have also, what I wanted to stress uh, uh, around the sovereignty is that we are working uh, a lot with uh, some public sector organizations mm -hmm. who really rely on this open source productivity to keep sovereignty and their collaboration in the IT landscape. Yeah. So you see, if I step back, for me, one of the key success factors for open source is really transparency, sovereignty, and of course, the power of the community but this is driving innovation and business value. So still there is a lot we need to do on uh, helping the organizations to understand what does it mean and how do I really execute it? How do I take uh, benefit of it and how do I keep it going? So we have seen multiple examples fail on the do it yourself idea, which yeah. all of a sudden is very dependent on one or two individuals. And when they pass on or go on an island for vacation, um, everything is breaking. But coming back to the three uh, core factors you mentioned, can you talk a little bit about the economic impact as well? Yeah, because I, I think the, the figures you mentioned are very impressive. Huh? And uh, it's really complement, I, I think, this experience and success. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, what I like is that we've talked about the past because I, I wanted to start, you know, from uh, where we, we started with, uh, with HPC. But as we are going on and progressing, we see that there are a lot of initiatives and Europe has launched, uh, you know, this great initiative, uh, GaiaX, uh, that mm -hmm. will foster co-development uh, in an open and secure and trusted uh, U European data space. So we are funding member of GaiaX, very much involved in this initiative uh, that will sit on top of open source infrastructure solutions uh, so that large and small players can also continue to innovate uh, and deliver value. So I really think that the future will continue uh, to pave the, the way uh, for more open source. So I think this is a fantastic initiative and I do hope that we can really jointly 
um, all together drive this even more into all of the European countries. It's a great opportunity for individuals, but also for smaller organizations as well as larger organizations to lift the idea of sharing um, and jointly innovating um, and expanding footprint. But um, on this end, can you also elaborate and share some examples on how open source enables powerful digital in innovation and sovereignty in terms of freedom of choice, mm. vendor lock-in, anti-vendor lock-in, um, as in service scalability, interoperability, and portability. So more or less the core of the Artos uh, business. Yes, and, and you're right. Let's take example. It's always easier to uh, yeah. say ideas. Yeah. Uh, so I've selected one which is, you know, on everyone's agenda. Um, and uh, let's see how open source community today helps driving projects uh, that has an in significant impact on carbon footprint. Uh, because you know that all the companies are going to the net zero and have a net zero strategy. So we know that today IT is responsible for 4% of the carbon global emissions, but we also know uh, that it can help reduce 15 to 20% mm -hmm. of the emissions of the rest of the economy. Yeah. So we talked, we have talked about it, but really the the shift to the cloud uh, is, uh, is an important way uh, to reduce uh, carbon emission because of cloud efficiency. And I will just talk about the fact that uh, we have application performance management solutions that mm -hmm. you know help display dashboards uh, and uh, with uh, giving visibility of the resource utilization, also the cost. Uh, and so if you take the principle that you can act on what you mm -hmm. see, this is very valuable. Mm -hmm. And also, um, there's a lot of, uh, uh, I will name, uh, you know, everybody knows about Kubernetes, huh? uh, which helps uh, auto scaling and, and orchestrating uh, the, the, the containers. And it helps enable having the right sizing of the infrastructure. So this helps also reduce uh, the carbon footprint. If we look, at ju I just wanted also to mention, it's not directly linked, of course, to open source, but um, cloud providers are more and more getting their uh, electricity yes. out of uh, renewable energy, uh, mm -hmm. solar, wind, water, geothermal, mm -hmm. etc. So this is very, very important. And you see, uh, actually, uh, I'll take this example, moving uh, the, the cloud solution and uh, adapt it to uh, the smart cities initiatives. Uh, in, in the previous talk, uh, uh, there was mention, of course, of a smart city. Uh, it's, uh, it's, of course, a, a, a huge initiative where we rely on uh, Internet of Things and devices. Mm -hmm that connect the various components, uh, making the city's infrastructure and services. So smart cities use those technology, cloud, IoT, uh, to deliver actually better services to citizens, to connect with the citizens, and of course, uh, to improve their lives. Mm -hmm. so, by creating uh, this network of objects uh, capable of uh, really smart interactions, we improve and we have many use cases. I will detail some public transportation we can give and we know uh, accurate trans traffic reports, but also provide real-time energy consumption data. And, you know, the use case is it's limitless. Uh, um, and, uh, and, and there's a lot of, uh, of course, applications that are coming uh, that uh, uh, gather those data and uh, give insight uh, out of them. And so, you know, I think this example is really key because the world is becoming more and more urbanized. And we know yeah. that by 2050, uh, over 60 percent of the world's population will be living in cities. So it's really crucial to make those cities a better place. Mm -hmm. and make them also sustainable and mm -hmm. uh, with uh, efficient uh, streamlined uh, services. And, and, you know, I also like this example, Petra, because we are working together uh, on, uh, on such projects. If yes. I name the, the city of Bordeaux, for example, in France, we have been looking how to aggregate information from various sources traffic, buildings, waste management, air conditioning, heating, and we have created a, an application for citizens. They're able to look and see in real time what's going on. And of course, we are running those workloads using uh, our uh, offer, AMOS, which is uh, Atos uh, Manage OpenShift. Oh, mm -hmm. with you. So, you know, the real idea actually uh, by building those platform is to enable decarbonization of the city. Mm -hmm. 
uh, with intelligent transportation systems, uh, but it can go up to smart agriculture, uh, healthcare. Uh, so we collect uh, data, uh, and that's the first step, and we collect data in a standardized way. And I give also example uh, of uh, open source we are using, Fireware. You know, we are both mm -hmm. at, at part members of the Fireware yeah. Foundation. Yeah. And very useful because it provides API but by which we can um, it facilitate actually the consumption of the IoT data um, and we can process in a contextualized uh, way. So you see there's a lot to do. We have been, uh, by the way, optimizing uh, a lot of those uh, solutions, for example, to reduce the latency uh, mm -hmm. of uh, sent in a smart mobility context. And uh, also, I want to mention, we will talk uh, later on it, uh, that we participate in a European uh, project, which is called uh, Green Move, uh, where we improve open source components and uh, also the open data model. So listening to you, certainly the carbon footprint um, and helping to reduce it is one of our, uh, one of our great opportunities uh, we have with open source, but also um, when you take recent examples with better connection, with better sharing, with really taking open source principles in, in our daily life. And uh, we all suffer from the same effect. The pandemic we are right now in is not stopping at borders. Don't care about different governmental rules or any type of policy rules which may be different. We are a connected world. And uh, for this, I truly believe that when we continue with ideas like smart cities and really expand them, it will be a better place um, for all of us. However, there is still this type of, what does this mean? It really mean? So does, what, do, what does that mean for me as a person, as an individual, as a citizen? Uh, what is your view on that? Well, you know, what I think is very interesting in this approach is that we are building solutions out of open source components and using also standard open data models, but mm -hmm. we tailor uh, the solutions to each need, to each city. Each city is different. Um, and, and, and there's many uh, use cases. You're asking yeah. what does it bring to me? For example, uh, some cities will have the ambition to create new opportunities for collective mobility, uh, which will lead uh, to a decreased environmental uh, impact. Mm -hmm. So, um, those uh, those smart city solutions can bring that. For example, you can include uh, data-driven bicycle mobility. You can also uh, give so bring solutions uh, which helps you reduce uh, the time to find a parking slot near the shop you want to go. And you can also have incentive, uh, for example, uh, offering the parking ticket. Mm -hmm. You can also uh, use this to reduce the air pollution, you know, giving real-time information to the drivers and um, for them to avoid specific areas or reduce the speed of the car to limit uh, the CO2 e emission. And also, it's very helpful, of course, for all the city administrators because they have in real time a dashboard uh, uh, giving them uh, all the elements to, uh, to act and, uh, and uh, find solutions for their own cities. And I'm pretty sure there are endless more ideas coming up. The more creative people we connect and the more yeah. ability we give people to um, just discuss with each, with, with each other and one idea is topping up the other one idea. So meritocracy, being very open to share ideas and collect all of them, I think is a core in the future process. So one beauty of open source certainly is its flexibility and the openness. So how is Atos supporting open source in the enterprise? How are you using open source in your own developments? Mm. So maybe what I... I I can I can answer to this question first to, to the contribution. Huh? So, you know, mm -hmm. we've said it, Atos is a platinum member of Fireware. Yeah. Uh, it contributes to the to the community. Our Atos mm -hmm. Research and Innovation is the open source owner uh, of the Fireware I, IoT LoRa agent. So it manages uh, the components and the and the and the GitHub. Um, and also uh, we you know we launched a, we did a great announcement between uh, IBM and Atos in uh, January, end of mm -hmm. January. And we will create a smart waste energy monitoring and optimization solution, which will leverage uh, IBM Watson and the Red Hat uh, OpenShift to help manufacturers and waste management companies to optimize uh, energy consumption. 
So, you know, I think also that uh, in this new area of data economy, uh, with a federated approach of data management, we will need to make use of trustworthy ecosystem uh, with, a gov with a common governance uh, for data space. And uh, actually, you said it, uh, the open source community has a major role to play uh, to provide also some software development key connectors, but also it really helps for me driving consensus. Mm -hmm. So as we recognize that we need uh, 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 an increased sovereignty in this digital world, we really think that open source enables to share and trust um, the technology, because as you said, it facilitates collaboration and consensus. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I have, I could give you some example um, of... Uh, uh, Go ahead. Yeah, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please give us some examples specifically. I'm also interested in this um, consideration you mentioned around ecosystem. So this is one of our core themes and uh, representing the partner side, I believe in really connecting different partner types. And we see this now today, all of a sudden, we are connecting a global system integrator with independent software vendors, with cloud providers, and all of them have to come together at a point. So this changed massively over the past. So I'm, I'm curious on your other examples and considerations. Yeah. But maybe what I, you know, I think that open source is, is really a journey and a mm -hmm. mindset. And uh, okay. yeah, and and I think there's maybe three angles we can take this journey. Okay. Um, the first one, and you said it, sometimes we we start projects and it doesn't work. But I think the great strength of the open source is that it enables you to start projects and you don't start it from scratch. You have everything here, and uh, mm -hmm. just take AI with TensorFlow. You know, mm -hmm. you just start to cloud design some model uh, together with. Uh, power stack to package mm -hmm. new uh, administration services. So this is a great, a great asset. The second as aspect for me, which is very important about open source is standardization. Mm -hmm. Open source really drives consensus and so the standardization. So for example, when you have to, to run tests uh, to comply to a given standard interface, um, well, this is absolutely key. Uh, if you take hardware design, if you want to comply to open compute or Gen Z standard, mm -hmm. same for software, you know, when you want to comply, for example, to open MPI to follow up the PC example. So really open source drives this standardization. Mm -hmm. And the third point is that is more from a research standpoint. Uh, and here uh, we have, you know, the, the, the great help of the European Union, uh, which actually opens up projects, uh, for example, Horizon 2020, which enable us to do some future developments. Mm -hmm. And so I think as we are moving along and as governments, but also enterprises are moving into more and more open source, well, those uh, assets are going to be leveraged uh, more and more. And um, I wanted also to take maybe the, the example of uh, the, the software defined approach. Um, but uh, now I think uh, Astor is going <laughs> along. <laughs> okay, so maybe I'll, I'll take you to, uh, a, a few examples on how uh, we can contribute because I think that's also the nice thing about uh, open source. We can contribute in many in many ways. First of all, you can integrate bricks uh, in your own development, but you can also do, of course, testing, and then you issue bug reports. You can be part of communities. You can submit some features. You can take part of the review process. Uh, you can do consultancy. You can support customers who don't really know how to go on with uh, open source. And you can even open inner source, inner source communities inside the enterprise. You see behind the firewall. Yeah. So that for me, it's just sharing uh, the uh, the open source spirit. So it allows, uh, um, allows us to innovate faster, to collaborate in a different way, to solve problems in a complete different way and hopefully faster. And another aspect, just throwing it in whilst Astor is pushing us a little bit around, <laughs> is also that uh, open source, open standards allow everyone to communicate. So it's a perfect way to also look at um, all the younger people who are looking for new opportunities for their future, how can they get engaged? Um, and you mentioned some of the examples. I think there was a lot happening 
for young people who want to get into open source into something they can learn of. So that's really great. So we have covered a lot of ground in the past 30 minutes. And uh, for those who are further interested, I'm pretty sure there are some links and materials still available. Yeah. So you're giving me a thumbs up, I hope. Yeah. So it was a huge pleasure, Sophie, to share the stage with you. Back to Astor, no? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Uh...